a menace. You should stay behind bars. Developing now, growing concerns tonight over what critics call over-lenient sentences that may enable some criminals to commit violent crimes. This comes after a violent offender with mental illness was out on the streets with no supervision just weeks after being released from a jail sentence. Now, Alexander J has been charged with murder and two assaults. Investigators say that all three of the attacks happened in a span of 13 hours back in March. Como's Tammy Mutasa is live to break down just how much power judges have when it comes to sentencing and a message from one of the victim's family members. Tammy? Eric, while the victims want changes, they believe these horrific crimes could have been prevented. And they say the decisions by the court are impacting public safety. I hope he spends the rest of his life in prison. The families touched by violence are wondering why a violent repeat offender with mental illness was out on the streets. Alexander J is charged with shoving a nurse down two flights of light rail stairs, stabbing a woman 10 times, then bludgeoning Brent Wood to death, all in the span of 13 hours. It's hard to deal with. I've never dealt with anything like this before. Brent's heartbroken family believes the tragedies could have been prevented. He's a monster. Two weeks before the brutal attacks and murder, Jay had been released from jail after serving a 22-month sentence for breaking into an 89-year-old grandma's house, criminal trespass, and assault. He shouldn't have killed my brother or attack these people. Prosecutors say Jay's sentence was in line with the 22 to 29 month statewide sentencing guidelines set by lawmakers. And when it comes to sentencing, judges consider an offender score. It's on a scale of zero to nine based on past felony convictions. Jay's offender score was five despite his past felonies. When 22 months was up, Jay was released with no supervision because under Washington state law, people who commit property crimes like residential burglary don't get Department of Corrections supervision. Many have questions that sentence. It's so hard with cases with mental health issues. It's so hard. Retired Judge Shirley Wilson is not commenting directly on Jay's case. You're trying to protect the public and at the same time, bear in mind that this is an individual who's ability to assess the situation and make a reasonable decision isn't there. She served 20 years in Seattle Municipal Court overseeing mental health and domestic violence. She says while judges have state mandated minimums, they have latitude in deciding the lower or higher end of the sentence. It depends on the convicted person's history, the crime at hand and victim's impact. A large part of sentencing somebody is accountability. It's holding them accountable for what they did. And that's why the circumstances are so significant. In the meantime, Jay's attorney tried to get the assault charges dismissed because he failed a competency hearing and was ordered to go to treatment. But Western State still has no room for him. A judge did not dismiss the charges. But Jay is still getting paid $250 a day. He's not in treatment. They're like rewarding them for doing crimes, which is crazy. And by the time Jay is expected to get a bed, get this, the state will owe him $37,000. Right now, he is locked up on a $5.6 million bail. Back to you guys. Tammy, thank you. Tonight, we're asking on ComoNews.com, do you think local judges should be doing more to keep violent offenders off the streets? Right now, 97% of those who've voted say yes, 3% say no. You can still weigh in. Just look for this story on our website, comonews.com. Continue to follow breaking news out of Everett. A deadly shooting near 96th Street Southeast in the Rivercrest neighborhood, not too far from north from Eisenhower Middle School. Let's get right back to Como's Hannah Knowles, who is live with what we know so far this morning. Hannah, we heard that first, that 911 call at around 3 o'clock this morning. Good morning, and that's when police say the husband called 911 after he says three men wearing a mask and face paint barged into their home, all while their young child was inside. The Snohomish County Sheriff's Office says deputies searched the house. The suspects nowhere to be found. Officials say from what they can tell, it looks like it was forced entry. The men made their way, their way well into the home. The wife was shot and killed on the second floor of the residence. Right now, detectives are gathering evidence and security footage and trying to piece together what led up to this deadly night. Right now we're, we're on scene. Um, all the neighbors um, have been notified and they're aware of what's going on. This is an active investigation. Um, of course, hard and emotional for all of them involved. 
and neighbors waking up this morning to police cars and caution tapes say it's unsettling that this is happening in the area. O'Keefe says there's been three other home invasions in the area. Police do not know if the incidents are connected and say that this investigation will last well into the day as they try to figure out what happened, talk to neighbors and gather any evidence. And Hannah, were the child or the husband hurt in any way? So thankfully, the child that was inside at the time was not hurt. The husband has minor injuries, but he is still here on the scene and working with detectives and investigators right now. I'll send it back to you in the studio. Tens of thousands of people are coming into Seattle for some big events that are happening tonight and then through the weekend with the Seahawks playing at Lumen Field right now, the Storm playing at Climate Pledge, plus the Emerald City Comic Con event at the Washington State Convention Center and Hamilton playing at the Paramount. It's going to be a busy around here. Como's Denise Whitaker spent the day talking with visitors who are going to some of those big events. Denise? Right, it's a pretty exciting weekend for a lot of people coming into town. The Downtown Seattle Association is closely tracking the recovery of downtown Seattle. Right now, they tell me that visitors during the month of July are at 94% what they were in July of 2019. So we know people are coming. Are they having a good time? And people are inviting and friendly. Julie Robinson and her daughter Samantha rarely miss the Emerald City Comic Con. Making their annual trek from Walla Walla, their cosplay this year is a scene from the movie Weekend at Bernie's. I think it's pretty welcoming still. I feel a lot better that they put the mask mandate back. Organizers here tell me they expect 65,000 people this weekend. Not quite near pre-pandemic numbers when Comic-Con regularly welcomed 100,000 in a single weekend. But still, a lot of people here to have a great time. Thousands of these Comic-Con fans injecting money into Seattle's economy, staying in local hotels, eating out and shopping something local business owners are happy to accept. It feels good to actually be, you know, contributing and making money again, so. It's nice to see all the people. Our town is still growing. I'm not sure if people expect the, the, the growth that we've seen over the last 12 years or so to slow down, but I don't think it's going to. 16-year-old Braden Ball, here with his dad to cheer the Chicago Bears against the Seahawks, tells me he's really seen a change for the better. Because I remember coming here when I was little and I felt really uncomfortable because they're just a lot of drug use and stuff and stuff all over the ground, but now it looks clean. People seem more friendly and more open to do anything here in, in Seattle. One of the most common sites to see in the city, Pike Place Market, is still working to get back to pre-pandemic levels. Right now, seeing about 70% of the out-of-town visitors this July, as it saw in July 2019. It'll never be the way it was. No, it just won't. Okay. But it can be almost as good. Still, the vibe is certainly thriving here in Seattle. People really having a good time. Back to a few of those numbers. Foot traffic back to 83% compared to 2019. When it comes to downtown, office workers, not nearly as many coming back to work in downtown. That right now only at 42% compared to 2019. Live in Seattle, Denise Whitaker, Como News.